I like your rules. Uh, Melvin Kranzberg is a historian of technology. He has some rules. It's a great article. Um, it's sitting on my website, but if you, I'll tell you where it is. But his first rule is, technology is not good. It's not bad, but nor is it neutral. And Buxton's corollary to that, that's Canadian for corollary, um, <laughs> is that without informed design, it's more likely to be bad than good. That's a pretty simple rule, pretty simple corollary. And what just once you acknowledge that, it says that the minute you recognize the rule and the corollary, the corollary, I can't remember my thought, is that it's, a, it's an ethical obligation to make best efforts to make the right decisions. And that includes a paperclip. It includes a, not a physical material technology, but a social organizational technology. And it's the challenge, though, and this comes back to what you were talking about, which I was very happy about, was that, of course, you need criteria to make a decision then that actually have to do with the ethics. I mean, what are your values? And you, it's, it can't be. I and mean, what currency? So I don't mind if we optimize profit, but what even currency are we going to use? And, and these are pretty interesting things. And then, and then the question comes down to, well, so how do you even think about this sort of stuff? By the way, the second rule, I'm not going to go into the rest of the rules, but the second rule I actually kind of like, because it says, um, invention is the mother of necessity, which my corollary to that is that basically, or the, would be that for every generation N technology, its role is to fix the problems of N minus one, but keep the good stuff. Ah, but what about that? That's also a value judgment. It's all about ethics. It's all about values. And when you say, hey, I'm going to organize a society, I'm going to design our society, um, I'm going to engineer it, well, no, 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 that's too Orwellian. You can't do that. But if you believe Kranzberg's first law, everything you do is doing that very thing. And so the only question that's worth asking is, shall we leave it to random, chance, uninformed, ignorant actions, or should you try and make best efforts? We will never get it right. We should never have to apologize for being human. But we shouldn't use being human as an excuse to not even think. So a lot of this stuff's about education. I guess there's an educational device there. We might talk about that. Um, so there's all this thought about, I was thinking I just uh, I just wanted to say this to Roger Martin, uh, who's a really good friend, uh, is that actually, Roger, I want to be a non-jargon spewing economic vandal. <laughs> and, and maybe we need to have clear stories. This is, this is a really important thing. Uh, the, the kinds of non-jargon spewing vandals are the ones that say, we understand the rules of economics, say that when the cost of goods approaches zero, the effect of price inevitably for that product goes to zero. We've seen it in music, and the music pirates weren't bad. Well, maybe they're bad, maybe they weren't. But they were not causing it. They were just accelerating it. And every single other entity that goes digital has zero cost of goods. So whatever's happened to music, it's going to happen to literature, news, cinema, theater, and so on. Now this is really interesting. So we'll fund it with the advertising. But if everything's digital going on the net, Who's going to, where's the money for the advertising going to come from? Now, if we were going to do some education, uh, the education might be that, for example, what we do is we help shift the mindset that when you buy a newspaper, you're not buying the physical object. You're buying the third estate and the right to have democracy, for example. And we've seen the consequences a few years ago when the third estate lets us down. Um, and you can sort of say, well, why is he rambling on about this stuff? Well, because I can't design an ebook without thinking about that stuff. Because I don't want to design the, the most 
incredible experience of reading in electronic things, very, very green, so that I saved the trees, 500,000 trees in the boreal forest of northern Quebec and Ontario that go to landfills every month from newsprint. I don't want to do that and now have this ultimate reading experience when there's nothing worth reading by the time I do it because there's no professional authors and there's no professional journalists because they can't make a living. And so there's these very interesting challenges that are not in the normal discourse when we are designing computers and we're designing these technologies. And yet, um, even though it's not in the discourse, doesn't mean we're making really critical decisions about those types of items. Now, this can become a really distressing st story. Um, I think I saw you, t I think you said you're an optimist. I'm not an optimist. I'm a skeptimist. <laughs> and, and I think that's the critical thing to do is stay this balance between being you know, the most cynical skeptic. And that's what a designer is, by the way. You can, you can be both at the same time and not have it bother you, uh, which actually is what makes you a good designer, I think. Um, so a lot of this has to do with, comes back and says, so OK, we can talk about this stuff. Now, what do you do about it? How do you construct your life? How do you organize your organization, your company, and so on and so forth? And, and so I, I have to do some science. I am a scientist. Um, how many people have ever had a really good idea? It's in your own mind. It is, it, other people don't have to agree with you. <laughs> Can you remember where, who you had one of them with? Did you notice there's a bias in that question? I automatically assumed you had that great idea in a social situation. I'll ask you another one. Do you remember where you were? And when you're actually thinking, you have this most, these, we have the flow, you have those great ideas. Do you actually take notes? Do you carry around like a moleskin or something like that or, or a tablet PC um, to keep a diary of when, when was it working? What were the circumstances? Because I do, absolutely. And then I structure my life to always be in that situation or as much as possible. What do I need? so that it can be productive, because I have to be productive. And this comes down to this sort of thing about place. So I actually do have a research project of which you were just part of it. And it's, it's, it's actually called uh, Cognition's Really About Place. The acronym, of course, is CRAP. Um, so I'm not trying to pick on you, John. But there's, a, but, but there's a lot of myths around how we think, how we op operate, and how we, we function that I think are counterproductive. One of the myths is, is that you have to be a multinational organization before you can support basic research. It's not true. I set up a research group in a company called Alias Wavefront. Every one of your cars was designed with our software. Um, less than a $100 million company. I had a research group where every person in my group had to publish in the peer-reviewed scientific literature at a level that would get them tenure at Stanford. Through four changes of ownership, seven presidents, the group, and I left in 2002, the group was quadrupled in size, where the rest of the companies, through, through mergers and so on, has, has been reduced. There's lots of other ways. Uh, I, I find it bizarre in the computer industry, it's all about memory, it's all about search, retrieval, that we have no history. One of the reasons why we have the situation you were talking about, Alice, is that, check this out. I, I was a professional musician for 20 years. That's how I made my living. I went to music school, not to computer science. It is inconceivable that you will be taken seriously as a critic writing about music, theater, art, dance, cinema, or architecture if you do not, when you write about that thing, place it in a social, cultural, historical perspective. Every cultural entity, cultural activity requires that. That's called basic literacy. When was the last time you saw anything dealing with technology written about in that context? The iPhone is a direct descendant of the world's first smartphone called the Simon. It was developed by IBM and Bell South in 1993. And if I told you without saying that, I, hey, what if we had a smartphone, one button, the whole front of it being a touch screen, and you did everything by touch by, for the address book and so on and so forth, what would you call it? You'd all say iPhone, and I'd say no. Of all of the articles you've read, 
and I mention this despite the fact it's Apple and I'm not, I don't work for them, because this is one of the most written about technological, cultural artifacts of the last five years, probably the last decade. You will not find a single, I do not believe, even if you use Bing, I do not believe <laughs> that, that you will notice a single case where anybody's drawn that parallel. Now, why is that important? Well, the reason that's important is because it says that invention, creativity, we've been sold a little pack of lies, that it's about this individual genius. We live in the cult of the individual, the sports hero, the superhero, I want to be this, I want to be that. That's absolute unmitigated bullshit. It always is social. And the, the best line about this is, one of my favorites is from William Gibson, where he says, the future's already here, it's just not uniformly distributed. <laughs> and and I, we can go even further in that, in that, in the, you know, the immortal words of Jose Jimenez in the first line of uh, Fahrenheit 451, it says, says, if you give me ruled paper, write the other way, is that, uh, who's, you guys were talking about creative theft. I don't know, somebody's talking about creative, no, it wasn't creative, you just said theft. I stole this from somebody, I think it was from NASA, okay. It doesn't matter. The point is this, I stole Chris Anderson's long tail. And if you just flip it around the other way, you have the long nose. And, and that's the long nose of innovation. And it turns out, if you look, and there's really good data from the National Academy of Science, um, you can download the, both reports, and, and every single technology and information technologies and telecommunications technologies, it was at least a 20-year long nose. The mouse, of which I own several hundred, it's my next book, it really is it's scary, it shows you what my life's like. Um, the mouse took 30 years. It was invented in 65. I first used one in 1971. Xerox Park got one around 73. The first commercial one was in 1982 with the PERC Three River Systems thing. Then the Xerox started, Macintosh in 84, but it wasn't until Windows 95 that they became ubiquitous. 30 years for an, for an idea that everybody knew was a really good idea when it came out. But these are, these are things that are important. A graffiti in the Palm Pilot, you can trace back to a slave of Cicero from 63 BC called Note Tyroni. It was used to record the minutes of the Roman Senate and fell out of use in 1100 when the Pope banned it as the instrument of the devil. But what I'm trying to say is the stuff has been there before. The long nose, this 20 years says anything that's going to have, oh, by the way, maturity from zero to maturity, maturity is defined as being a billion dollar industry. So in that, it says that anything's gonna be mature in the next 10 years, it's already 10 years old. And that fundamentally changes the nature of innovation, design, and creativity, because it says it's not about invention, it's not about alchemy, it's about prospecting, mining, refining, and then taking that gold and turning it into something that's worth more than its weight in gold, as a goldsmith. But it's not about that. I come back to a saying. Anybody who walks in this room knows I'm the speaker and you're not. Why? Because of space. What I'm really interested in, this is my crap theory, when my member said cognition's about, oh, really about place, is that the problem with shoving your head in a CAT scan to watch the synapses fire when you're thinking is that knowledge and thought only peripherally happens in the head. There's a great book, if you haven't read it, I recommend it, uh, it's called uh, Cognition in the Wild, it's by a friend, Ed Hutchins. He's interested in ship's navigation. He's trying to study the nature of cognition. And what's really fascinating about this book is that he, because he's a sailor, he likes hanging out in boats, so he's at UCSD, so he went out in the naval ships and he studied navigators. And the critical thing about this, and this is critical, if you care about design thinking, because every, and everybody does, of course, because it's too, you know, I'm not all in black, I, 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 I'll do that next time. But if I was in black, then I'd be totally about design thinking. But the, <laughs> but, but the thing is, let me be very clear, it's in the tools, it's in the placement of the tools in terms of the space, the context, and the social. It's about place, cognition, and thinking. Design thinking included is something that's about place, objects, tools, and yes, the cortex. But any concept, any discussion about decision making, about learning, about thinking, about social, educational, or design processes that does not, that, that conceives those things in the cortex, they're missing the boat. 
That's what you have to design. And if you want to redesign the culture of your organization, if you don't change the physical architecture and the tools and other things, you're not going to change the organization. It's not about a, a mindset. It, it's about a culture set. So let me tell you a bit about this, because this is actually this real story I came to talk. That was just the prelude. But the story is short. I had an interesting thing when, on my way to Providence. And so I sent, uh, actually, I didn't even send. I, you, Christine, you didn't even ask me for a, a, a little abstract, did you? You just, you just went through a bunch of stuff I'd written. and, and you know, They're fantastic. They pull all this sort of stuff together and they write back and say, hey, wow, I wish I could have written that. It's, it's, and about what I, what I was going to talk about. And, and I'd written an article about blackboards. And here's why. Because I have this theory, and it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a law. And it's a law, it's the law, it's the order of magnitude rule. And this is, this is one of the little tricks you can use if you want to be innovative and do something cool. And you're at a loss and you've got nothing else to, you're, you're sitting there looking blank at the blank paper. Infinite possibilities. Holy <laughs> um, here's the law of the order of magnitude rule. If anything changes by an order of magnitude on any dimension, any meaningful dimension, it's not the same thing anymore. And the, the creative, cre creative part in this comes from saying, what are the meaningful dimensions you could change by an order of magnitude? It could be size, speed, quantity. Like the quantity one would be sort of like Metcalfe's law. But it could be other things too. If you're really creative about what's a meaningful dimension for this particular entity. So <clears throat> since I work in computers and this looks like a tablet PC, so I'm talking about, well, so um, this is what used to be used in schools. My, my father, uh, he's 90, but when he was a kid, that's what he wrote on. And he's still alive and driving and stuff. And, and the thing that's kind of interesting is that all I have to do is this, and it's not a slate anymore. And it should be bigger, right? That's a really fascinating thing. Um, and, and what happened in this is my story is that I have this story about blackboards because it's like, what was there before the blackboard? And the answer is the slate. And as an engineer, as a scientist, I know it's got exactly the same chip technology in it, CaCO3, it's limestone. <laughs> it has the same user interface the same erase operator, you can share the documentation. And all of your skills transfer. Right? And the only technological challenge is making it bigger without it breaking and finding a way to stick it in the wall so it doesn't fall down. So as an engineer, as a scientist, as a technologist, it has no interest to me at all. It's one of these trivial things that's beneath Microsoft research or IBM research or these things to do. And yet, there was a guy who's uh, Samuel May, who was a very famous educator in the United States in the 1800s, and he wrote a book in, was it, uh, 1853, and he describes his first encounter with a blackboard. And he said, I realized immediately, this has changed everything, because it changed this personal thing to a public thing. Now, there's some resistance because, of course, it couldn't work because your teachers got their back to the students. Of course, good teachers just had the students write in the blackboard and then solved that problem. But it fundamentally changed education. And what's fascinating to me about that, of just an order of magnitude change, but also a change in position, there's no hard technology here, is that I believe that change had more impact on classroom education in the world than all than the cheap paper, which came in the 1860s with paper pulp or mills, not too far from here, actually, the first one in North America. The personal computer, networks, the internet, and perhaps all of those put together. And I might be wrong, but it's plausible. That's all that matters. If you give me whatever degree of plausibility, why did it take so long to even start thinking about electronic blackboards? Because we're so consumed with making a PC in every kid's desk, when in fact, one in the front with a big screen might actually be maybe more important, or maybe both. 
but maybe they need to work together. But it's a really interesting issue. That it's an order of magnitude rule in terms of the size of scale, and there's another change in another dimension in that it's fixed rather than portable. It's on the wall. But this isn't about technology. It's about place. But notice, it's also about learning. It's about understanding. It actually changes the cognitive structures and the way we work, think. So we have, this is, comes on the really, really long nose. But it, it says that, the, that if we forget history, and we don't, we're not literate on history when we're doing these really fancy dancy technologies, we risk learning. Because, and I, I would argue that the company may be fast, but the technology and the culture is really slow. And, if, and the key thing is we want to give this thing a nose job without lopping off the nose. That's what we're doing right now. You want a stupidity of our, our culture? There's fewer PhDs working in the private sector in basic research in the United States and Canada today than there were in 1980 before the Bail Dole Act was passed. I have no proof. That's my impression from the uh, uh, informal poll. If you're wondering why we're in such deep doggy doo, it's because we've been turning universities into advanced development labs, and yet Mansfield proved through studies in the 60s that if you go to applied research rather than curiosity driven research, you reduce productivity, you don't increase efficiency. That's just basic economics. Now, we need to learn this stuff. We have to understand the history so we don't make the same mistakes because we can't afford, we've seen the cost. But even just in terms of a basic thing of the chalkboard, it's pretty interesting. But here's what happens. Just to, and this is why I love, uh, this was so much fun coming, and I really wanted to meet, meet uh, Christine again, because see the blackboard, I had I published an article, and I write this column in Business Week on the, on, on the order of magnitude rule, and I think I used the blackboard, and, and I mentioned that there's this guy named um, Franklin Pierce Knitt, who invented, uh, yeah, it's NITT, pretty funny, eh? uh, who made the blackboard in 1801. And I got back my blurb for the book that you have, and they'd said, they'd replaced it with this guy named James Pillins, who's a Scottish teacher, taught geography, and wrote a book in 1868. And I said, what's with that? You changed my prose, how dare you? And, and, then, and then we said, oh, well, we should have told you, but, but, but we, we went on Google and uh, we checked and it said that uh, Pillins wrote the thing and we couldn't find anything in, on Google about, or Bing, about <laughs> Francis Franklin Pierce Net. And I realized, oh crap, we are screwed. If it's not on Google, if it's not on the internet, it doesn't exist. And all of a sudden, and so I actually went to this thing called a library. <laughs> and I went into the stacks, and I found uh, Pillen's book, which I, which, which, where he really describes his first experience about using blackboards to teach geography. And he did, in fact, use them. And, uh, but I also did some history, and he didn't start teaching geography until 1809. So 1801 is still a good date. But I couldn't find the thesis from this woman from the US Naval Academy or college who was talking about knit. And I can find nothing. I can't, I'm, and, and so the question is, it's a really interesting challenge. In, in this great day and age, if you want to find out who actually invented the blackboard, it's a really hard problem. Here's the other problem that's really hard. Who was the first European to go from Montreal to the Great Lakes on the St. Lawrence River up and down? I, you won't find that. You can't find that out. Anyhow, that's a totally unrelated thing, but it just. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm here to help you make your own stories by, uh, I tried to do what Bill suggested. Now, the thing is, is that then what turned out is that we have evidence in the United States that in 1801 at West Point, they did have a blackboard. There's a guy named uh, Baker. Now we know that. So that's, that's still consistent with Frank, Francis Nitt. But damn it, you know, this bloody Christine. She, she goes to the Mason's Journal, the, or the J Journal of Masonic, whatever the hell, from 18 something. And there's a story in there for the first Twitter. Because what they had was they had a chalkboard up on a church steeple to put lottery numbers across the town in France. 
in the mid-1800s. And, and it, it could be, well, the first tweets, but it was that. And then you go back and sort of say, well, but I don't even know what a blackboard is, because the, the, these things weren't called chalkboards in North America till, till into the 19th century. Previously, they were called slate boards, because they actually used another piece of slate to write on them rather than chalk. But then you sort of say, I've got, what if I'm just in a cave painting? Uh, I, actually, if you've seen me go around, I've got this sort of petroglyph thing on my pin, but it's of canoes, but it's from a rock thing from a buddy. They've got it for the Canadian Canoe Museum. It's a, but it doesn't matter, but they were scratching those on the rocks, so I don't even know what a chalkboard is anymore. So you start off knowing it is. By the way, next year, if you, you know, something like that, I'll decompose the phone so none of us know what a phone is, too. But I don't know, I don't know what a chalkboard is. And then I realized it doesn't matter because if I read my own damn book, I would know the following, because this is you know, the big banner on my webpage. The products that we sell, that we make, are not the things in the box, the physical objects, the materialistic things in this materialistic society. Rather, it's the experience. What the object of our design is the experience that they engender. We do not buy newspapers, we buy democracy. It's experienced and in, in being informed that it engenders. We don't buy a mountain bike. We buy the ability to scare self half to death and still not have to wear pampers. <laughs> and it, that's what it's about. And so just to wrap up, it's not about the blackboard. It's not about the technology of the blackboard. It's about epistemology. It's about learning. It's about social structures. And absolutely, it's about history. And absolutely, it's about social constructs. And it's absolutely about those things in a situated social, political, physical, and social context. And until those of us in the technology industry understand that the wetware is far more important than the hardware or the software, that is, the brain's 90% water, and it's just trying to say humanity, in the social, as it, and, and everything I'm saying, by the way, is true with organizational structures, family structures, or individuals. Until we don't, un, until we stop letting the tail of technology away, the dog of society, we're not going to make progress. And the first part of that is to show respect and not feel we have to invent it ourselves, but rather we can build on the backs of people like Francis Nitt. Thank you.